Welcome back to Derek's Zoo Videos, my channel where I share my passion for the zoological world. It took longer than I originally intended, but we're finally back at the fantastic Detroit Zoo. About 10 months ago, we toured the small but top quality Asian forest, and picking up where we left off, we'll now be walking into the African grasslands, one of the five major areas that makes up the top half of the Detroit Zoo. Like most of those areas, the African grasslands is made up of expansive open yards enclosed with large rock walls. The species lineup is pretty standard for an African attraction, but the well-known status of many of these animals can make this one of the zoo's more popular regions. However, there are still a few less common species to pique a zoo enthusiast interest, if you're lucky enough to see them. To start today's tour, we actually have to do a little backtracking from where we left off in the Asian forest. Just before the zoo's family of playful snow monkeys is a long row of glass viewing windows that look into the palace of Simba the African Lion. Lions are often dubbed the King of Beasts and have been associated with royalty for thousands of years, but Simba actually does come from royalty. He was gifted to the royal family of Qatar, but after a few years, the family felt it would be better for Simba to move to a more appropriate home. So, he made the move to the Detroit Zoo in 2012, where he currently rotates with the zoo's three females, including his three-year-old daughter, Binti, who is the first lion born at the zoo in 40 years. Up and around by the snow monkeys is the first view of one of the large open grassland yards that we'll see again later on. Circling completely around the snow monkey mountain, tucked in the back corner are a few smaller habitats that are easy to miss if you're not paying attention. First is a mesh habitat for a familiar zoo primate, the ring-tailed lemur, who as of February 2023 either rotate or coexist with a pair of newly arrived red ruffed lemurs, all of whom can be seen inside the hideaway indoor habitat during the winter. Further past the lemurs is an even more hidden building that once held meerkats. It is now known as the hangout, likely in reference to the sloth that lived here until recently, but it does still house an African rock python, and in the larger of the two habitats, a colony of African straw-colored fruit bats. Quickly moving back outside and heading back in the direction we came from is a long, dusty yard that until 2005 housed Asian elephants Winky and Wanda, before the Detroit Zoo became one of the first zoos to give up their elephants over concerns of the elephants' welfare. Like Indianapolis, Detroit found the perfect replacement in the form of Tamba and Jasiri, the southern white rhinos. Last time we saw white rhinos, I promised to talk about how they almost went extinct. So here goes. When European hunters first arrived in Africa, the white rhino became their preferred target over the black rhino since they were typically more social and less aggressive. 80 years of uncontrolled hunting saw the white rhino extirpated from most of their range until possibly fewer than 100 individuals remain. Conservationists successfully established Africa's first protected area in 1895, giving the white rhino protection from hunting for the first time. The population began to recover, but progress was slow until the 1960s when conservationist Ian Player kickstarted Operation Rhino which successfully relocated white rhinos to protected areas throughout their historic range, helping to accelerate the population's recovery. Today, there is around 20,000 southern white rhinos, making them the world's least endangered rhino. Past the rhinos, entering into a sort of dead-end plaza that contains one of the zoo's train stations, not too long ago you would have found two habitats for African painted dogs and what you'll still find today, the warthog. With the expanded exhibit space, this has got to be one of the best warthog exhibits out there. However, perhaps owing to the enclosure's large size, I haven't seen much of them in my last few visits. 
but hopefully if you visit, you will see Linus and his three daughters Daenerys, Sansa, and Cersei, who were born in 2015 and named after characters in the popular book and TV series Game of Thrones. Backtracking out of the plaza, across from the rhinos, is one of the region's largest yards. Currently, this habitat is an all-boys club, as you'll find Enzi, Jimmy, and Zizi, the zebras, living with Lenny and Jeffrey, the white-bearded wildebeest, who arrived at the zoo in June of 2018 and are the first wildebeest to live at the zoo since 1939. Even with the species' long absence from the zoo, wildebeests are somewhat infamous in the Detroit Zoo's history. Why? They are the only species to have ever caused the death of a human at the zoo. The white-bearded wildebeest is an iconic symbol of migration. Every year, up to a million wildebeests travel together, accompanied by zebras and gazelles, in their quest for fresh grazing grounds. Up to 80% of wildebeest calves, which may be as many as half a million, are born within a two to three week stretch at the start of the rainy season, which helps ensure more calves will survive since predators can only take so many at a time. It also helps that a wildebeest calf can stand and run just seven minutes after being born. Now, we've seen zebras before, but this trio of boys are a little different. These are Grevy Zebras, the largest wild equid in the world, with their larger ears and narrower heads giving them a more mule-like appearance. Also known as the Imperial Zebra, the Grevy Zebra was named for former president of France, Jules Grevy, who received one as a gift from the king of what is now Ethiopia in 1882. Unlike their plains cousins, the East African native Grevy Zebra is endangered facing threats of hunting, disease, and habitat loss. No African region would ever be complete without giraffes, who of course guests can feed at two scheduled times throughout the day. Detroit's giraffes include male Jabari, female Mapenzi, and their son Kivuli. In 2020, the trio was joined by a younger female, Zara, and now the herd has grown again when Zara gave birth to her first calf on May 31st, 2023, a male who has been named Jehundi. Giraffes are well known as the world's tallest land animal, and with that impressive height come some special adaptations. You may have heard that giraffes have the same number of vertebrae in their neck as we do, which is true, but theirs are massive, with each individual vertebrae being about a foot long. A giraffe's blood pressure is two and a half times that of our own. This is due to the great force their heart pumps with in order to send blood all the way to their heads. But what happens when a giraffe bends down to drink and all that blood comes rushing to their head? Well, they have a special jugular vein that blocks off blood to the head when the giraffe bends down and opens again when they rise. If you visit during the winter, the giraffes can be seen inside year round. Near the giraffes is a yard with low walls and plenty of dirt mounds and tunnels. Like the warthog exhibit, this used to be two habitats, with most of the space being for hippos. But after the passing of their last hippo in 2012, the entire space was eventually combined for their aardvarks, which again has to make this one of the best habitats around for this species. There's only one problem. I haven't seen an aardvark in here since the exhibit was expanded but hopefully if you visit, you will. The aardvarks can also now be seen in a public indoor exhibit during the winter called the Grotto, and I imagine guests may have better luck seeing them in there. So that we don't end on a no-show, I waited to talk about the animals of the watering hole, who can be seen near the lions and again across the path from the zebras and aardvarks. You'll find three common eland, Clover, who has been at the zoo since 2012, and Hops and her daughter Mwenzi, who joined the zoo in 2021. If you want to tell them apart, Clover's horns are straight, Hops only has one long horn, and Mwenzi's horns have a slight backwards curve. The eland is the world's largest antelope, but despite their large size and somewhat cumbersome appearance, the eland can jump up to 8 feet in the air from a complete standstill. And for your weird animal fact of the day, 
when an eland walks, the tendon in its foreleg makes a sharp clicking sound. Scientists aren't exactly sure why, but it may be used as a form of communication to inform other eland that this is their territory, since the sound can be heard from some distance away. These ladies also share their habitat with Hannibal the ostrich, a rescue who found sanctuary at the Detroit Zoo in 2015, coming from an unideal situation with a private owner. Among the ostrich's amazing adaptations are their fabulous thick eyelashes, which help protect their eyes during dust storms, which can be fairly common in their native range. In order to survive in these arid regions, ostriches can survive for up to two weeks without water, getting all the moisture they need from their food. Contrary to the popular myth, ostriches don't bury their heads in the sand, a belief that may have originated from observing nesting behaviors in which ostriches lower their heads into holes in the sand to rotate their eggs. And that wraps up another section of the Detroit Zoo. Relatively simple design, but nonetheless effective for showcasing many of Africa's most popular fauna. On our next trip to Detroit, we'll be moving down the path and walking through one of the zoo world's greatest exhibits. For this episode's question, comment below what is an African species you wish more zoos would display. As for our next tour, most of what we saw today has been around for a while, so on the next episode, We'll be mixing it up and seeing something brand new.